All right, welcome to PowerShell Summit 2021. I'm Damien Caro. I'm the program manager for Azure PowerShell, and I am today with Mike. Yes, I'm uh, Mike Robbins. I'm a content developer for Azure PowerShell. Thank you, Damien. So today we are going to go in this um, session around best practices for Azure PowerShell. Uh, we have a packed agenda. We're going to go through some fundamentals on Azure PowerShell or AZ PowerShell, as we like to mention it. We're going to look at best practices around installation, breaking changes. We're going to dive a bit into identity and context, what that means for you when you get started and how you want to look at that. Um, then we're going to get into troubleshooting and escape hatches, how you get out of troubles and, and problems that you may face. Uh, but without any further ado, let's go into the fundamentals. What is Azure PowerShell or what is AZ PowerShell? Think of it as a way for us to bring to PowerShell a, a, a set of commandlets that allows you to manage those Azure resources. And it brings the concept of PowerShell together with what Azure offers. Um, and, and you have that ability to then manage your resources as object in PowerShell, do all the wiring that you would do in PowerShell uh, natively because those commandlets are returning something that is totally understood by PowerShell. When we thought about it, when we started to build Azure PowerShell, we wanted to make it um, available everywhere. And because Azure can be managed from a Mac, from a PC, from a Linux machine. And one of the fundamental that you will see in AZ PowerShell is it is cross-platform. And all the commandlets that are part of AZ run and are fully supported across those different environments. I mean supported because it is fully supported by Microsoft. We build those modules even though we accept and welcome any kind of contributions from partners, uh, we are taking uh, full support for their quality and, and uh, issues that may happen with those commandlets. We, we had a long journey. Uh, maybe some of you have tried that before, but we are at a point now where 100% of Azure Server services are supported with those commandlets, which means that Whatever is available today in Azure, you can manage them with Azure PowerShell. That means a lot of modules, we, we have one module per service, and we've made it available in a simple way for any users with the AZ wrapper module. Um, the AZ wrapper module has the goal of making it simple and easy to acquire those, um, those, uh, those modules that are related to uh, Azure services. Um, they also have a shared authentication, which means that when you're authenticated, you can use those modules seamlessly and keep that authentication across the different services that uh, Azure offers. Um, I just want to make a note here on the AZ wrapper module. Uh, we only have in the AZ wrapper modules, modules that are marked as stable. And Mike is going to talk more about that, what that means, but it's, currently a subset of all the modules we have. We have some in preview. Uh, we are validating their stability and, and all of that. Um, but just keep in mind that when you do AZ, you will have some modules that are not available yet. We are definitely working on including those. So trying to understand what Azure PowerShell means. Um, Azure PowerShell, as I said, is those modules for Azure Resource Managers. We have two generations, and I want to highlight that a bit. We have modules that maybe you may see on the gallery with the name Azure RM. Uh, those are old modules, and they will retire by February 2024. Um, so I highly recommend to not touch them. Uh, we recommend to look at AZ modules, and in AZ, you will see some differences. Uh, some modules are based on SDKs and they are handwritten. 
uh, like AZ compute. Um, those have been are manually written, and you, if you look at the source code, they, they actually have a different pattern. Uh, but we started recently to create those modules based on their Swagger description. Uh, the benefit is that when we have a module, it basically has everything available. The all resources are available. All Azure resources are available natively when we do that work. Um, one of the differences between those two generations is that the generated ones have a subscription ID parameter, as an example, and the SDK may not have it yet. We are working on closing the gap between those two generations, but um, just keep in mind that you may see those slight differences. What does that mean uh, when you have those modules? As I said, it's basically wrapping operations that match, uh, that, that goes to, to uh, Azure. And each command in PowerShell has a verb, as you may know. And the way we've been thinking about it is matching the verb to an HTTP operation. Um, as you see in the table, the verb like new match a put operation, a get would match a get HTTP operation, and so on and so on. Um, I'm not going through the list. There's just one command, one verb that you may want to pay attention to is the set. It's confusing, especially when you have someone starting with Azure PowerShell. Um, the set actually may behave as a patch or as a put. Um, this is an inconsistent behavior that we know of for the older modules, the one that are based on SDK. Um, for the generated modules that are based on Swagger descriptions, the set is not implemented. We, we have made the decision to not implement, to reduce the confusion and, and clarify about this. Uh, going forward, we are looking at how we can address the set confusion, uh, but it's a complicated approach and, and we want to be careful to not introduce breaking changes for the sake of breaking changes. Um, so if we move from a put to a patch, it's a different behavior. And we know that it, it will create some chaos in, in scripts. So we want to be very careful on, on how that works. Um, let me jump very quickly into a, a demo around how HTTP requests work, and that will, that will give you a bit of insights on, um, on how to look at that. So I have a PowerShell, um, PowerShell session here, and I'm going to, to do a couple of operations here. Uh, the first one is I'm going to do a new resource group. And um, I'm in debug mode, so you are going to see all the operation happening under the scene. Um, what I want to highlight on this one, remember I did a, a new easy resource group. And if you look at the debug stream, the HTTP method is being logged as being a put operation. Um, so when you're looking at that from a REST API point of view, um, that's how it appears. If you want to do a get, and I'm going to do that get again, the get, as we said before in the table, is supposed to be a get. And if we go here in the request, same thing is being recorded, it's a get. So if you have some concern about what the command is doing, uh, what's happening on the scene, you run in that debug mode and you look at the HTTP request bar that will uh, help you understand how the command is interacting with Azure. Um, we could do that on all commandlets, uh, but I just wanted to highlight this new and get um, for, um, for a couple of for a resource group. ask how you get started and for that I'm going to ask Mike to help us understand how we install uh, Azure PowerShell. Thank you Damien. Okay for the installation of the AZ PowerShell module uh, it's available in the PowerShell gallery that you can use an install module to install it with which is part of the PowerShell get module. Um, it's also available in the uh, in cloud shell 
and you can get to Cloud Shell by going to shell.azure.com, and it's also available in Docker containers. If you're installing it locally, we, we recommend PowerShell 7 for all, uh, for all the different operating systems to include Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. And preview modules are not installed as part of the AZ PowerShell module, and I'll show that during our demonstration. Um, let's talk a little bit about Azure RM coexistence. And as Damien alluded to earlier, uh, Azure RM is the deprecation's been announced. It's uh, in February of 2024, so it's still going to deprecate by that date. And we have a toolkit, so if we have any customers who are still on Azure RM, we have a migration toolkit that can automatically migrate your scripts from Azure RM to a the AZ PowerShell module. Now, if you're a new customer, of course, you want to start out with the AZ PowerShell module. And let me jump into my uh, to my demo. So we'll talk about a little bit about installation. I've covered many of the the notes I've left in this script here. What I've got here, I'm not going to execute the install command because I have the AZ PowerShell module already installed, but you can see I'm running install module uh, using AZ for the value for the name parameter. And while it's not necessary, um, I would recommend go ahead and specify in the repository parameter of PS Gallery in case you do have a system that's got more than one repository registered. And also, we do recommend that you install it in the current user scope because one of the issues we've found is when you have different versions of the AZ PowerShell module installed in different scopes, meaning if you have some versions installed as the current user and some installed as all users, that can cause some issues. So with our uh, preview versions, so a preview version that has never been generally available or a GA is going to have uh, less than 1.0 version. And for example, the uh, the MySQL AZ PowerShell module, if I search the gallery for that particular module, you'll see the version is 0 0.6.0. Now, with, with a module that's already had a GA version, for example, SQL instead of MySQL in this scenario, if I ran the same command, you see it's version 2.17.0. So that is a GA version of the module. And if you installed the AZ PowerShell module, you would get the AZ.SQL module with that, but you wouldn't get the MySQL module. Uh, to find a pre-release of a previously GA module, you would have to specify the allow pre-release parameter. And that's whether you're using find module or install module. You can see there's a 3.0 preview of the AZ SQL module. So with the uh, Azure RM coexistence, the toolkit that you can install that I mentioned earlier that you can automatically migrate your scripts can also be found in the PowerShell gallery. and you can install it with install module also. Uh, for more information about migrating and about um, Azure RM, the deprecation, I would recommend going to aka.ms slash azps migrate. <clears throat> okay, and I'll jump back to the slide deck for a second. So let's talk a little bit about breaking changes. So with the AC PowerShell module, we use semantic versioning. And we have breaking changes twice a year, and that happens with major version releases. So, for example, between uh, version 4.8 and 5, 5 was a release that would have breaking changes. And when from 3.8 to version 4 was also breaking changes. So anytime you see the major version releases, that's when we have breaking changes. And we publish uh, the breaking changes as part of our release notes. And they're broken down by version. You can find that on docs. And there's an aka.ms link here that you can find more information about the breaking changes. Now with your scripts, you would, uh, would want to validate that they actually work 
and you're not using something that maybe a commandlet name changed or a parameter name changed or the output type or something to that effect. So if you would want to test your scripts with a new version. For identity, I'll turn it back over to Damien. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> so um, on identity, um, here we are. On identity, uh, we have a few best practices that uh, you want to be careful <clears throat> and keep in mind or keep under consideration when it comes to um, preparing your environment, but also uh, considering how you're going to run your scripts into an automation environment. <clears throat> uh, first of all, one of the best practice around identity and authentication more specifically is to ensure your az.accounts module is up to date. Uh, we, as a team uh, who managed and maintained the Azure PowerShell, we have a goal to not introduce breaking change in AZ accounts. We will really do it when we have no other choices, <clears throat> but AZ account is aimed to be one of the most stable modules we have. Uh, there are some improvements that uh, come along. Uh, those improvements are unlikely going to have any changes in the surface of commandlets that you're using, but they usually bring new security capabilities they improve the way we do the security or the authentication against Azure. And that's why we highly recommend to keep up to date on AZ accounts for that purpose. And the most recent change we did was with AZ account 2.x, uh, introduced with AZ 5.0. Uh, um, that had a change because we we moved our authentication library from EDAL to MSAL. Using MSAL allow us a few things that I'm going to talk in a minute, uh, but one of them is to ensure that your uh, tokens are encrypted and secure on the box where you're running your PowerShell script. Um, the other thing that we brought with MSAL or that MSAL brought to us was the ability to do that interactive logging. Uh, so when you do a connect AZ account, uh, the interactive logging is now the default behavior. Um, uh, so those are few few of the behaviors that have been improved with the account. And again, keep in mind that we're not introducing booking changes on this account and keep it up to date as much as you can. Um, from the authentication point of view, PowerShell is made to run script. And how you do the authentication with scripts? Well, you have different ways of doing it. Uh, the one that we usually go for is use service principles. And that's what they're made for. They're made for automation purposes. Um, a best practice is to have the secrets in a key vault, um, Azure key vault, um, or you can use any other vault that you may think about. Uh, for that, there is a session at the PowerShell Summit that talks about secrets management, um, the PowerShell secrets management module. And I highly recommend to have a look at it because we've worked uh, to ensure that Azure Key Vault was well integrated with the secrets management module. And that gives you a way to uh, use different vault while not having uh, to change the, um, the, the script itself. So consider having your secrets for service principle in a key vault. One thing that you may want to think about and we would recommend um, when you're running workloads in Azure, uh, like a VM or Azure Functions, um, there is this concept of managed identities. And, and managed identities allows you to run your script from that environment with no real secrets per se. So you're using the identity of the resource that is running your script to manage to authenticate to Azure. Um, so you're in the VM, you do connect uh, AZ account dash identity, and you're getting the permissions of that VM. It, it has some benefits because you don't have to manage the secret on your script, but the challenge is anyone that could access that VM could run with that identity without having any more uh, need uh, to know any secrets or anything else. So 
You want to balance a bit those two, but it's something you might want to consider to make a script that is very clean of any variable or anything. And, and that, can, that can bring some benefits for you when you're running those scripts. <clears throat> so once you're authenticated to Azure, <coughs> um, AZ PowerShell is going to use a context. The context is some form of object. Think of it as an object that has a set of metadata that is used by Azure PowerShell to maintain that authentication against Azure Resource Manager. The context has benefits because it not only has the account definition, the tenant, the subscription ID, the, the environment uh, endpoints, um, and that, that is all saved locally in a JSON file. Um, so you have all of that into this context property. But the challenge with context when you run again into automation environment is it is saved on the disk on a regular basis when you run those commands. The challenge with it is that it has a performance impact. And you might say, well, I'm running five commands. Nah, who cares? Um, but if you start having challenges on the performance of long running scripts, or if you're very thoughtful of the impact it has on shared environment, uh, you may want to do two things. One is disable the AZ context auto save command, use that command, because what's going to happen is you think of two scripts running with different contexts. They're going to um, fight with each other's potentially, and, and they may actually not get the right context or the right permissions or the right info. So you want to use the disable AZ context auto save. And the other one is, uh, because if a script that runs on the shared environment is not yours or is belonging to a different team or someone you do not trust, you do not want to share that context that can be used by someone else. So think of that disabling the AZ autosave context. The other aspect around context, it's a limitation on how we manage them. Uh, when you connect to Azure, we will populate, <clears throat> we will populate context associated to the first 25 subscriptions. And I would say some time ago when Azure was new, um, people didn't have a lot of subscriptions and, and that was fine. But now we see a lot of customers that have more than 25 subscription or they can use more than 25 subscription with one, uh, one account. Um, so one of the issue we're facing or we're seeing from customers is, well, I, I'm connecting to Azure and I don't see my context. I don't see the context I want to use for my, um, uh, for my script. And we recommend to, and, and that's kind of a challenge because you're populating context with, it takes time and doesn't bring any value. So we recommend to connect in the case of, of um, automation account, connect and skip the context population. So that's going to gain performance to your script. And, and then, you do what we you use the set easy context command to create a context object in that JSON file I was talking about, naming whatever you want and associate to the subscription ID that you're using. By doing that, you're going to have a much simpler simpler uh, context file and it's going to be easier to manage for you. Not only the name is going to be much easier to recognize, but you only have the one that actually matters for you. Talking of set AZ context, um, there has been, I've seen on GitHub, people discussing and asking questions around set versus select. Um, set AZ context is changing the context for the current session only, unless you use it with the dash subscription like I've done above. Select AZ context is going to set the default context in the JSON file I was showing. There is an entry at the top that says what is the default context, and the select easy context is going to store that default context in your JSON file, and it's going to be used in future sessions as well. So think of that the difference in set versus select. Um, so select is making it for current and future sessions. Set is just going for the current sessions, a uh, current session. So. Those are best practices around context management, and context management is, is an important piece 
in Azure PowerShell, it's the first thing you're going to hit when you connect to Azure. Now, once you're authenticated to Azure, um, Azure is using OAuth, and OAuth comes with <clears throat> exchange of, of tokens. When we worked on, uh, on Azure PowerShell, AZ PowerShell, with the new version, the version 2.x, as I said earlier, we are using the MCL library. The MCL library brings the benefit of having an encrypted token cache. So tokens that allows you to access Azure are now encrypted and secure on your machine. But there are configurations, there are situations where you want to get access to a token because you want to run a command that is using an access token and, and it, it's complicated to, it was complicated to get it before. So we've introduced a get az access token command that allows you to retrieve that token from the encrypted token cache and, and use it for other purposes, other commands. Uh, I'm going to go through an example here. I just copied some code on the screen, but I'm going to do the demo around uh, how to use access token. So I'm going to clear my environment before and um, I'm going to remove the debug stream because that's not what we want for this demo. Um, so I'm going to, uh, let's say I'm going to try to run a SQL command. I have a SQL server in Azure with a database um, and I have opened the firewall. So the ports are open, everything is, is clean. Uh, now I'm going to try to run a simple query, uh, a SQL command query. So there is a module, um, a SQL module, that allows me to run an invoke SQL command. And you pass a server name, the database, and the query. So that command, if I'm trying to run it like that, it's going to tell me it doesn't work because that server in Azure doesn't support Windows login. <clears throat> so the other way of authenticating to a SQL, to run the SQL command would be to pass the Azure SQL username and the SQL Azure uh, password and, and run that command in the in the query. We're going to do it slightly differently here. Um, I'm going to uh, retrieve an access token <clears throat> with my um, AZ access token command. So the get AZ access token looks at my token cache, get that token for the um, for the resource URL I'm specifying in that case that database.windows.net. Uh, this is important because that is def defining the scope of your token. So you can use the token, that token for database.windows.net resources. I would not be able to use it for other purposes, but let's come to that in a minute. So I have my access token. Um, I can show you how it looks. Oh. Token. That's how my token looks. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to run that SQL command, but now I'm going to use it with my access token. And you see, I just pass here the command access token. Um, and it's pretty much just a new parameter that you can pass in your, um, in your, in your command. I'm running that. And we just have a tiny problem with the IP addresses. So that's a, that's a question I had, I had to deal with before. So let me update the IP address. So we are fixing that. That's the beauty of live demos. Looks like I changed my IP address. All right, I have my query now. I can run the, I can run my uh, query with access token. Here it is, and here we go. Um, in my database, we have just two entries, uh, but that's, that's how it works. Now, I could try to use, um, uh, I can try to use that command. Uh, let's say if I'm trying to access graph as an example, 
I could use a connect graph with my access token. Um, oops. Um, so I'm passing that token to another uh, resource graph. Now, if I'm trying to get uh, resources in graph, for example, um, getting a service principle ID, uh, since the token I'm using is not for the graph uh, scope, as you can see, that command is going to fail. So if I wanted to use graph with that access token, I would have to specify a different scope and I would use that access token for that uh, other scope. So once we've been there, I'm going to let Mike explain a bit how we can do troubleshooting when you face problems with Azure PowerShell. Thank you, Damien. So yeah, let's talk a little bit about troubleshooting. So we're going to talk about the debug preference, and also we have a troubleshooting page that we've created for for Azure PowerShell. And also, I have we have a link on the screen here for where to report uh, issues. You can report them in uh, in GitHub. But let me uh, let me jump to my demo. So I have a demo on troubleshooting. And one thing that you've probably seen already from uh, Damien's demos is when you enable, when you change the debug preference to continue instead of silently continue, you get much more information. And it's it's debug information, but it's very similar to using the verbose parameter with other PowerShell commands. And I'm just gonna demonstrate that for, uh, for those of you who didn't notice when Damien was running commands. So if I if I try to get an AZ resource that do, doesn't exist, it's gonna it it really doesn't tell us anything. It just returns nothing. But I can specify the debug parameter, and you can specify that on a command by command basis. It'll give you debug information. It'll kind of tell you everything that's going on behind the scenes, and it will tell you. Uh, many times it'll give you additional information that will will help you determine what the problem is for yourself. Now, sometimes maybe a command calls another command and maybe specifying the debug parameter on a command basis doesn't help. And I believe what Damien did earlier was uh, change the debug preference for his entire session from silently continue to continue. And that does the same thing, but it does it for every command in your session until either you close and reopen PowerShell or you change it back to silently continue. So now if I run the same command again without the debug parameter, I get the same debug information. And of course, um, to go back to normal, we would uh, set it to silently continue. Because once you get the information you want, you don't, you don't want to see that for every single command you're running. Now, one thing I want to talk about with troubleshooting and kind of going back to what we talked about earlier with breaking changes, and this is also related to troubleshooting. So one thing I didn't mention is that pre-release modules don't have to adhere to the breaking change policy. So that pre-releases or preview modules can introduce breaking changes at any point in time. So that's one thing to be aware of because maybe you're using a preview module like the uh, the MySQL module I showed earlier, and all of a sudden you've gotten a new version and it's not a breaking change window, but now you've, you're having problems with it. Well, that's one thing to keep in mind if you are using a preview module. An uninstallation of the AZ PowerShell module is another kind of culprit of problems, and it's because it's not, it's not designed the way that necessarily the way that every other PowerShell module is designed. So when you install the AZ PowerShell module, currently it installs 65 other modules. And I also think that Damien had kind of mentioned this earlier that it installs, usually it's a module per service, but not always. But that's kind of how you can look at it. So in order to do the uninstall, of course, uninstall module only uninstalls one module, so it would only uninstall the AZ PowerShell module if that's the name of the module you specified, and you would be stuck with these other 65 modules. 
whatever method you use to perform the installation is how you should perform the uninstallation. So there is an MSI available if you want to perform like an offline install or for some reason you can't access the PowerShell gallery. And if you install with the MSI, you want to go into control panel and add remove programs and deinstall from there, you'll see an entry for Azure PowerShell. And if you're not sure how you perform the installation, if it's been a while, you should start out with the M MSI method for uninstalling. So go into add remove programs. If it doesn't exist there, then you know you use the PowerShell gallery. And what I'm going to be showing here is, is with the PowerShell gallery. So you can easily get a list of the, mod the 65 other modules that I mentioned. And in the future, I'm sure that'll be more because there's a hidden XML file that's put in the module folder that has a list of dependencies. And this is good information for not only the AZ PowerShell module, but other PowerShell modules. So you can see currently I only have version 5.7.0 installed. And really we, we would prefer that customers only have one version installed because you're going to have less problems. Now it is supported, of course, to have more than one version, but if you're going to do the uninstall, it's recommended to uninstall all versions of the AZ module because, for example, more than one version of the AZ PowerShell module depends on the same version of AZ.accounts. So if you installed all the dependent modules for, for example, version 5.6.0 of AZ PowerShell, well, you're also uninstalling the version that 5.7.0 would need of AZ accounts. So that's one thing to understand. And even if you don't really want to un uninstall all the modules, perform the complete uninstallation of all of them and then just reinstall the version you want. So what I've done is I've actually ran this command. You can see the one version that of the AZ PowerShell module I have installed and I stored the results in a variable. I'm going to use that variable to query the location where that module was installed and the format of the file is CLI XML, so I'm just going to pull the dependencies right out of the local file. And you can see all the different, uh, I'm sorting them in descending order. And what that does, all the different modules depend on AZ accounts. So this gives me a list of the modules I could uninstall. And AZ accounts is last by doing it in descending order. So since all the other modules depend on AZ accounts, it'll prevent a lot of errors from occurring when you're performing the uninstallation. Now, one thing I did run into, and this is something to be aware of, install module has a limit of 63 modules that can be uninstalled at one time, even though the name parameter accepts an array of strings. So I'll go ahead and run this. You'll see it can't handle 66 modules. Uh, so evidently, since I've run this demo, I said 65 modules, there's been another module added. But the limit is 63, so if you're going to uninstall this way, you would have to run it through for each object, since that number of modules is not directly supported. As I mentioned earlier, we've got a troubleshooting page, and you can log any issues that you have in our GitHub repo. So let's jump back to the slide deck. And now I'll turn it back over to Damien. He's going to talk about Azure PowerShell escape hatches. <clears throat> Thanks, Mike. Uh, yes, we, we, we've we seen that you may run into some problems every now and then. And, um, and one thing that is important for us is to make sure that you can self escape from troubles. And um, and one thing that we've heard from customers uh, as we were building the different modules is we were missing either a commandlet or a parameter, or we had modules that were using an old API version. <clears throat> so in order to help customers to um, kind of find a way to manage resources that are not currently supported or were not currently available in, in Azure PowerShell, we created, um, we created two type of commandlets or two commandlets. One is, I'd say, star az resource. It's basically a get set, uh, get new, um, sorry, a new get and delete az resource. Um, and that's a generic commandlet <clears throat> that will allow users or anyone 
to manage a resource that we have not defined. The challenge with it is that this resource takes a PS object to define the payload, um, and, and you need to create that object before you actually make the query. Uh, if you want to do a new, if you do a get, then uh, you're going to use that uh, easily, and but you'll get the object at the end of the day. <clears throat> the other one is invoke az rest method. So that one, same idea, it's using the current context, but you're building your HTTP request and the payload is a JSON string. Um, so you're going to tell me, Mike, uh, likely, well, I prefer a PS object. <laughs> I'm a PowerShell user and I, I use to manage a PowerShell object. And I would say, yes, that's totally fine. But JSON is easier to read because if you do uh, if you do a query on the wire, you will know what the JSON is, is, is returned. Uh, you may see uh, the REST API, uh, the REST API spec that will have a JSON definition of your of your payload as well. Um, or if you want to manipulate different different tools to to manipulate that. So that's why we created this invoke AZ REST method. Um, we have an article uh, ak.ms/azrest that. Um, will help you understand how the invoke AZ REST method works. Uh, but I'm going to do a quick demo. We have um, we have a couple of minutes. I'm going to do a quick demo on showing you how we can look at a resource group, for example, uh, or different resources here. <clears throat> so first of all, I'm going to do a... You remember when I did my query before? I had a SQL database and I was running my SQL query. Uh, let's get the resource here. And I'm going to do a get easy resource for that, um, specifying the name of the resource and then the resource group name. <clears throat> what is returned is, as I said, an object which has the resource ID, so that's the full URI of the ID, the resource type, and then the name and the resource group name that you may be using. Um, so that's the get easy resource commandlet. Now, if I want to get the SQL server that I was showing before, <coughs> excuse me, I would use a command that is much longer. I will have to use the resource group name, the name of the resource, of course, but then I have few parameters more to specify. Um, the resource provider name, and in that case, I'm looking for a Microsoft.SQL object. And what am I looking for? I'm looking for the server. I need to specify the get method and the API version. So you may say that's much more verbose. I need to put more parameters to get there, which is true. But at the same time, it gives you a lot more flexibility in how you want to navigate that, that, um, uh, that resource. The return is a basic PS object, but what matters is what is in the content. And I'm going to zoom on the content. The content is, as I was saying, the JSON object. So you may uh, you may want to run this. Uh, Oops. And then you can use that SQL content and convert from uh, from JSON. So you could do uh, that content and do a convert and here you go you get your um, your code powershell object uh, in, a, in in a, in a power you, you get your sql server in a powershell object um, so those two commands really have the idea of allowing you to uh, still run your PowerShell script, manage all your resources as you want them, even though we haven't implemented that uh, yet. Um, we have a goal to reduce the time, uh, what we call time to market, but basically the time it takes for us to have a resource supported. Uh, so we are working on making sure that we have that um, addressed. So going forward, we should see less and less the need to use those uh, escape hatches, but we wanted to make sure that we were talking about them today.
So we're getting to the end of the of the session, and we have a few key takeaways that we'd like you to um, keep in mind when you think of Azure PowerShell best practices. One. AZ PowerShell wraps the API calls and bring them into native PowerShell commandlets. We are trying to find the right ba balance between a release cadence that follows the Azure rhythm and Azure release every, every day and breaking changes that impact scripts, impact what you can do or how you're doing things today. So we are trying to find the right balance. Um, we're always learning and listening from you. Uh, so tell us what you think about it, uh, and we can always adjust. Authentication and context management is important in the context of automation. Um, think about how you manage your context. You want to deliver the context to make sure that you have um, faster authentication and a smoother authentication with your scripts. Access token. Very useful when you want to use resources um, that do not um, that that require an access token. Uh, think on how you manage the token and then specify the audience. Escape hatch uh, allowing you to fully fully cover uh, what is available today in Azure. And finally, uh, think about how you can get help get. Uh, support, open tickets uh, for GitHub, um, and also the source code is available on GitHub on the same link. Um, we have the culture of doing the work in open source mode, so you're going to see that our work items are on GitHub. We are transparent on this, and, and we really want to, um, to keep that culture going forward, so, so you can listen from us on the, on the repo. Two key resources are documentation ak.ms slash azps. That's where you can get the official reference doc and official documentation on how to use Azure PowerShell. The source code issues and discussions. We've opened discussions recently on the ak.ms azps code. Uh, we really want to have uh, the conversations with you. Uh, we want to listen from you. Um, uh, please go there and file issue if you have problems or open discussions if you want to talk about something. Finally, uh, we have a Twitter account, Azure Posh, that represents the team. Um, let's stay connected. Uh, this is where we talk about new things coming. It is also where we listen on what's happening. So if you want to talk about something, you can tag us. That's always very welcome. Um, I'm looking at Mike. Mike? Did we miss something? Yeah, I have one last thing. So I'm not sure if uh, the attendees noticed, but when you were typing in your commands, it's like it tried to auto-complete those. And one thing to, to that's actually called predictive intelligence. And Damian presented a session with Jason Hilmick at the summit also. So be sure to uh, to either catch it in person or watch the video on demand. Absolutely, very good point. Um, with that, I would like thank, to thank everybody who attended the session for their participation, and uh, I hope you've um, had a very instructive uh, time. Thank you very much.